You are listening to the podcast When Life Gives You Lemons, presented by me, Emma Levy. Having worked with elite athletes for most of my career, it's always intrigued me that a significant number of high-performing individuals have encountered some form of adversity earlier in their lifetime. My fascination into this grew when I had my own brush with adversity, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer in May 2020, in the midst of the global pandemic at the age of 36. During this period, I questioned whether it was my positive mindset, or maybe something deeper, which enabled me to bounce back and to train and compete for a triathlon just one month following completion of all active cancer treatments. The goal of this podcast is to explore this concept further by meeting a variety of high-performing individuals who have experienced adversity, but who have come back stronger. I'm so excited to be back for season three, and today I'm kicking off with chatting to the fabulous Dr. Sean Williams. Sean is a counseling psychologist as well as a broadcast journalist, where she has spent the past 35 years on radio and TV as a reporter, producer, and anchor. She is probably one of the most well-known news presenters, anchoring BBC Breakfast for 15 years, and then more recently was the main anchor at Channel 5 News. She currently presents the podcast Life Changing on Radio 4, which has a similar theme to our podcast, as Sean interviews people who have been through extraordinary events but come back stronger. This is just a taster of what Sean has done professionally in both the broadcasting and the psychology world. But why I am so excited to talk to her today is because I think she is able to hold a unique perspective on trauma. Having initially as a broadcaster been an eyewitness to some horrific events, she trained as a trauma assessor. She then experienced significant adversity herself when she went through her own breast cancer. And she has since qualified as a psychologist specializing in post-traumatic growth. Sean, thank you for coming today. You know I've been trying to get you on the podcast since the beginning because your story really, really does interest me. So can we start very early on in your broadcast career? Am I right in saying you'd always had an interest in trauma and so you trained as a trauma assessor to help your journalist colleagues deal with the impact of covering these harrowing news stories? Can you tell me how you got into that? Yeah, I think... (sighs) I always wanted to be a journalist when I was growing up. My dad said, who was a journalist himself, said, um, never be a journalist and never work for the BBC. <laughs> because because he thought that actually being a journalist was tough, that you'd see some tough stuff. And he was being protective of his daughter, I guess. Um, and and I loved being a journalist from the beginning. But you do you are exposed, obviously, to the worst day of people's lives. And and you're in it with them, but you're there with them in order to help them, I guess, tell their story and help the audience understand what's going on. And the way into a story for a journalist is through the personal, is through the experience. But what you get is, I guess, not just the potentially traumatic event that you're reporting on or producing or presenting from, um, but you are also with people at a really fragile and vulnerable time for them. And I think that creates a kind of a lot of stuff that, that can be quite hard to deal with and quite hard to process, because what happens is you, you go out, you do the story and then you come back and often you're on another story and you don't really have time to reflect on what you've seen and heard. And and I think I began to sort of understand that there was potentially an impact of that on, on me and my colleagues. And I didn't train as a trauma assessor until, when was it? It was about 15 years ago now. So that's about 20, that's about two decades into, into my journalism career. But I think all the way along, I was thinking, how best do we as journalists manage and negotiate this this really this tension between holding somebody's story at a really difficult time for them and looking after ourselves so that we get to tell the story well and that's when I so I retrained as a a trauma assessor. So did you find that you were taking on their suffering did you feel that personally or did you witness it in your colleagues? Do you know, I, I think at that stage, it was less about taking on their suffering and more about how do I best represent them and, mm-hmm. and look after myself and hopefully others 
in the process of doing it. So where is my responsibility here to me and my colleagues and and more importantly, I guess, to the people whose lives we're parachuted into? So I, I think it was more about that. And I think the reason I started on this sort of long journey to become a, um, a counselling psychologist is because I wanted to understand how the brain works in trauma. So when you are, I mean, trauma is only trauma if it's perceived as such. An event is not necessarily traumatic unless somebody feels it's traumatic. So trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens in you. Does that make sense? So different people will experience different events in, in a very different way. Now, you're not going to know that as a journalist when you go out. You're going to not going to really know how people are. But you can, by understanding how the brain reacts in that kind of fight, flight, freeze moment, which is common, by understanding that, perhaps we can understand how people behave and why they behave a certain way. No. So what then motivated you to train to be a psychologist? Was it that process from being a trauma assessor and you thought, oh, I want to know a bit more here? So there's a limit to what you can do, I think, with the training I had as a trauma assessor. Um, and and I thought I, I need to I need to understand more. I don't I don't you know, I'm, if, I, if I'm to be with people who are struggling, I need to really understand the way the brain works, what questions to ask, how to listen well, um, how to walk alongside them when they're going through something and hopefully get them to a place where they're managing better. And and that's when I retrained. um, Well, I I did a master's in psychology um, at, at the University of Westminster, which was amazing and terrifying. And I remember one of my supervisors I, there were loads of sort of you had to do lots of essays and it's quite theoretical sometimes and there was lots on sort of neuropsychology and how the brain works and there was a huge module as well on statistics now I didn't have a maths qualification at all and I hadn't realized obviously hadn't read the application form properly that there was this big statistics exam you had to do anyway and you had to put in some um some homework as well and I remember putting in a bit of homework and it came back and the score the, the score was really low. I mean, really low. And I went through it and thought, no, I think he's marked me wrongly here. So I go into my supervisor and I say, I think, I, I think, I think you've missed a couple of marks that I could have picked up here. And he looked at me and he said, you may think of yourself as a success outside because I was still broadcasting then. I was still doing, was I doing breakfast then? Anyway, I was still at the BBC. You may think of yourself as a success, he said, outside this university. Here, you are a student. Here, you are learning. And here, you will occasionally fail. And I thought, that has put me right in my box. Because you are, you know, you are. It's, it's like the more you know, the less you know. I, I was doing a master's and thinking, there's too much here for me to know. There's just, there's so much. And it was, it could feel really, really overwhelming. And then doing a doctorate, it's like we're piling it on, you know. And, and you get to a stage where you think, I thought I had it, not that, I mean, goodness, I've never had anything sussed. And when I was at school, I remember a school report. It was a guy called Dr. Waller who'd written on my school report. Sean is a very small girl with thin powers of concentration who tries hard and is keen to please. (laughs) I'm now now in my 50s. And that's probably the same. I'm probably a very small (laughs) Well, with thin bounds of concentration, you try so hard and it's keen to please. Um, but I try hard. I do try hard. It doesn't necessarily come, come easy to me. So, yeah, I mean, I worked and worked and worked. Just yeah, and I, and I, I'll, I don't think I'll stop learning because you can't. Yeah, it's the same as my role as a physiotherapist, and that's what I love about it. It's continuously mm. evolving and learning and developing with each patient mm, I see. Exactly. I think. It's, I think that's one of my favorite things. Um, but I read that yeah. you spent three years working with cancer patients and trauma patients whilst you, I think, whilst you were completing your doctorate in counseling psychology. And you were doing that in the morning whilst in the afternoon you were still presenting the news. That's quite a contrast. How did you find the two jobs linked together? That's a really good question. So I, I spent my one of my placements in my first year was at um maggie's i went for maggie's 
to Maggie's Cancer Centre um, and put in a placement request to work there and work with a very good psychologist there. So firstly, I didn't know whether going into cancer was a good idea, having had a cancer experience myself, having lost my mum, yeah. having lost my aunt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I thought, if you are new to this counselling stuff, this psychology stuff, then go in on something that you feel you understand, even if you cannot possibly know somebody else's experience. But but that but sort of the perhaps the common feelings of, um, oh gosh, it, it just shock, bewilderment, sadness, confusion, um, self blame, um, lack of self compassion, um, fear of recurrence um lack of control all the things that you can experience in cancer as you as you might know yeah i mean i don't know how many of those tick any boxes but i some of them might for you yes of course and that's why i was actually very interested to see that you had worked or you had and you do still work with cancer patients because i wondered if that mm. was I, I, I kind of I understand how that can be helpful in terms of you empathizing where they've come from, but it also feels very close to home. And I wondered if that could yeah. be quite triggering when you're a psychologist yeah. with those people and you're constantly being reminded of the, reminded of the emotions that you felt. Yeah. And you can't bring your own stuff into the room. That's that's, mm, the that's really, hard. Really you cannot bring your own stuff into the room. So so, you know, because then it, because then it's about you and it shouldn't be. It should always be about them. So um, they. So in the in the first year at Maggie's, you know, nobody knew that who who I was because when I'm, you know, hair back and no makeup and you know, why would somebody off the telly be sitting in front of you doing <laughs> as a counsellor or a psychologist? You, you never get recognised at all. Um, I've been recognised. So I've been doing this now, well, for five years. Um, uh, and I, I, psychology, and I've been recognised twice. Wow! And I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours because you have to for the doctorate, but also I work in the NHS now with the emergency yeah. services, so I'm continuing to see people. Um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of hours, and I've been recognised twice. So it's um, fascinating. Mm, yeah, yeah, and and I I say I say as well when I am um it that it, there's always somebody who's i've got brilliant colleagues you know so they can always go to but i think I, which, which they can choose to do i think if you're sitting in front of somebody and you feel like they're, they're helping in some way and there's a relationship there the most important thing in psychology is not necessarily you know your qualifications or your what you've done or it, it's the relationship between you and the other person if you feel that relationship exists or they feel that relationship exists then then they'll then they'll stick with it but I did the cancer for one year um and and then I did and then when I was on channel five I went back to cancer and worked in um psycho-oncology so I worked for a big London teaching hospital in their psycho-oncology department as you know mm -hmm. hospitals are brilliant in that they offer psychological care to people experiencing cancer and that was mm -hmm eye-opening and and because I'd had I'd had um counseling um mm. after my cancer experience at UCH and so I just thought you know if you do one thing Sean if you do one thing with all this training go back and give hours to other people because you benefited from it you know how crucial it can be in that recovery so go and do it yourself and and yes occasionally it would be hard you know when you're working with people and they're dying and you want to do more than you're doing you want to mm -hmm. and, and and you can only do what you can do and you can only be there holding their hand when they're struggling but but sometimes that's that's enough for them and i think helping people understand why they're feeling a particular way and and more importantly letting them know that it's not their fault that they feel like this you know, it's 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 not their fault that they're trying to find um, a, a not a reason but an answer to the question why did I get cancer, and and when there's a vacancy, when there are no answers, then sometimes 
people will t- will look at themselves and say, well, it must be my fault for this, or it must be my yeah. fault for that, or um, I'm not doing this, or I'm not, you know, and and how do I tell the kids, and what do I do with my, my partner, and how do I manage mm. the worry of other people? You know, so, so lots and lots of questions with 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 no with no answers, and yeah. and so, there's a. I found I researched. I then went and researched it. So I published some academic research on compassion, self compassion, and self criticism in cancer. Mm. And what I was looking at was people who have high levels of rumination, so brooding depressive thoughts high levels of sort of self-criticism and real negative perceptions of themselves in the cancer experience and and just are unable to show kindness to themselves because they're so busy worrying about other people mm-hmm. and then um, on an eight-week mindfulness course where mm-hmm. they got to be with group and they got to sort of reflect and lots I mean, it's quite an intensive course but at the end of it I tested them again and they'd 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 learned some things about themselves by reflecting on their cancer experience and themselves in that experience. And, and their levels of their levels of sort of catastrophic thinking went down. Um, their levels of self-compassion went up. That kind of, yeah, okay, you know, you need to be kind to stop being kind to other people. It's now time yeah. for you to A, accept compassion from other people. That's another thing that people with cancer sometimes find it really difficult to reach for the answer. It's outstrip. very hard. It's hard to accept help, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I remember being desperate for a reason, you know, also asking my, mm. my oncologist, but, but why, you know, what have I done wrong? Have I drunk too much alcohol? Have I eaten too much mm. meat? Or, or was mm. it when I was vegan, I ate too much soya, you know? Mm-hmm. And I remember her so mm-hmm. clearly her saying, this is not your fault. Nothing yeah. you would have done differently would have changed this outcome. And I found that such helpful advice. And I think following hearing that from an expert, I stopped looking for reasons. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 think, I, think, that's, I think that's really important about that, that trying to take away that fault, idea of fault and idea of self-blame. And, and we know that, of course, that some cancers are... In, induced by I don't know smoking and drinking and we know that but also a lot of it is genetics and bad luck a lot of it is will something be turned on inside us and we don't know why that happens we do not know so you know I was looking at my lifestyle saying oh it's because I got up so early for so many years and I'm stressed and you know I'm running a busy life and etc etc and I think that way that way madness lies you because because you've got to be able to say it's here i'm yeah. i'm living with it so how best do i live with it yeah do you think your experiences of having cancer and i think you lost your mum and your dad sadly to cancer do you think those experiences have helped you have helped you as a psychologist oh. i don't think Grief necessarily pr- helps you as a psychologist. Yeah. I think perhaps understanding loss can, I don't know. It's all, I think everything is so individual to, to, to the people who sit in front of me, you know. Um, mm. Grief is horrible. As you know, grief and loss is really difficult and back and forth. And sometimes you think you're doing okay with it. And then it can, it's, it's like there's a, there's a Hokusai painting. Um, and if I, if that you might be able to see it, um, if you're, if, if anyone is also watching this on your podcast, um, there's a, there's a bit of it just there. Can you see yeah. it on the frame? A Hokusai painting called The Great Wave. Um, and, uh, and I think I think grief is a bit like that. You know, there's a tiny boat in this in this wave, and you can feel like you're being swept up, and then you crash back down. Has it helped? Me? It's really hard to attribute life experiences and say this has made me a better X or Y. Um, I think it's led to a, perhaps a better understanding of myself and how I react in those in those circumstances. And I think 
being, shall we say, a more mature <laughs> psychologist who's who's experienced a lot of life and yeah. loss can help when you're sitting in front of somebody because I think they can, even if they don't know it, they can perhaps sense it. Mm -hmm. um, but but I think that's a really hard. I think that's a really hard question to answer. Yeah, it's life experience though, isn't it? Which is so helpful, I'm sure. It just to help you understand the people that are sitting in front of you. Yeah, indeed. And and I think and I think you continue to to learn from every person that that you're in front of. So I was in cancer for two years. I worked also in family trauma, so complex trauma with families. I worked there and I worked with King's College London for two years, um, helping uh, mainly um, university students who are going through a lot of high anxiety and stress. And now I'm working in the NHS uh, with um, emergency service workers, so police workers, ambulance workers, fire workers, wow. etc who experience a lot of trauma day to day. And you know, <clears throat> I think the reason why I really wanted to go for that job was that there was an understanding, even though it's quite different being a reporter and a journalist, obviously, because emergency service workers are there to help and journalists are there to witness. And that is a very different role. But that understanding of a sort of a cumulative effect of going to these places again and again and again, and just being aware of what might come up for you if you do that. I really yeah. enjoy that work. Yeah, um, I get the feeling you don't necessarily like to talk about your own cancer publicly. You know, you wrote a book, Rise, uh, but you state in the introduction mm. how you were quite scared for it to be read. Um, I don't think you discussed your cancer publicly whilst going through it. Um, is that still the case? No. And what, so are you happy now talking about it publicly? Yeah, I, I am. I, and I think, am I happy talking about it? Um, I'm, okay, I'm okay talking about it. It's not who I am. Are you comfortable talking about it is maybe a better word. Yeah, yeah, I'm, com I'm comfortable with it because it's it's something that has is part of my life experience and part of many people's life experience. I think, I think the thing I was wary of at the beginning was not – was wanting to protect my family and for it not to become, I didn't want it becoming a story. And, and I really, I, the, the idea of sort of brave ex breakfast star battles cancer, that was yeah. the headline that I didn't want to see while I was, while I was going through it for lots of different reasons, because a, you're not brave um, because it just happens to you and you get on with it. Um, the ex breakfast is fine. <laughs> the battles, I hate the. I, I really do not like the 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 war analogies that with cancer because uh, many people I love have been very well equipped to quotes fight and quotes have lost. So you know, it, 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 I, I I don't like it. I don't like the battle. I don't like the victim. I don't like the um the language that surrounds it. Interesting. I don't mind the the terminology around battling don't and you. fighting. Tell, tell me because I've had this kind of discussion a few times because it did feel like a fight. I don't know a better word of describing it necessarily. And I, the bit I do understand is it's, is yes, some people lose that battle. It's not their fault that they lose the battle, but they do still lose the battle. Mm. It's just a fact. And I, I don't know. I mean, do you have a better way of describing the fight? I guess the way I'd describe it for me was like being being on a oh couple of couple of things come to mind as you're saying that I, I'm more interested. I, I just want to pause for a sec though and find out when you say that 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 understanding it as a fight really helped you. In what way did it help you? Do you think? I think it helped me put on my boxing gloves and go and go get it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, it helped me yeah, yeah. rather than rather than sit back and let things happen to me. I wanted yeah. to be in control of that fight. I wanted to to be there, strong and ready to take on whatever was going to be delivered. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So there was something about control there. Yes. So, so, so framing it as a fight allowed you to feel in control of a situation where you didn't have control. Yeah, I think you're correct. So was it then about being in control of the bits that, that you could be in control of? So which, which bits of that cancer experience? Sorry, I'm asking you questions. <laughs> but which, <laughs> which, which bits of that experience did you feel you could apply that to which helped? Is it possible to identify them? Yeah, it was any bit I had control of. And for me, the main bit of that was like my exercise training. I always okay. say that was the one bit that I could control. Yeah. You know, I could wake up on that morning and know that I could go for a run or, yeah. or, yeah. or not. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it gave me the control. And oh. that, that was my way of controlling it. Exercise was really quite pivotal for me. Um, and I think you're right. It was control. It was the one thing I had control yeah. of. So I wonder whether then, and and this might tell me if I'm wrong, but but I wonder whether that rather than you seeing it as a fight against the disease, you were seeing it as a kind of collaborated a collaborative fight to recover. Does that does that make sense? So in all yes. the fight yeah. was about the yeah. fight about the control of recovery rather than the fighting the disease or both yeah yeah you I could reframe it that way probably quite easily no I'm not asking it. you I'm not it asking wasn't you to like reframe. I, it's quite an interesting it's quite an interesting conversation because I always hear yeah. this this people say they don't like the fight conversation yeah. I've always wanted to say to someone but why but why right. it's actually for me it felt like a fight Yes. I never said, oh, I never, interesting as well, I never felt like I won, you know? Yes. It, it yes. wasn't necessary. So maybe you know there's aspects of the fight. I wonder whether it's a fight for self-preservation. I wonder, I wonder whether that is the fight rather than the fight being on a cellular level, like I'm going to kick this disease. I mean, yeah. and, and, that, and that is sometimes, you know, that is the thing. That is the thing that helps. I'm going to kick this disease. I'm going to fight this disease. Or whether it's a kind of, a, do, do you know what I mean by a fight for self-preservation and a fight for recovery? Oh, absolutely. And just like, if I can't control all this bit of it, then I'm going to down mm. I'm going to get up and I'm going to exercise because I know that's going to make me feel better. And I know if I'm healthier, I'm in a stronger position to recover. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in my fight for recovery was where I also came up with the idea for this podcast. So I was exercising my mm. body, but I was also exercising my mind because I started to look a lot into mindset. Yeah. Um, and that was when a friend recommended your book, interestingly. So I was recovering from cancer and um, she was she's actually also a broadcaster. And she said, have you read Sean Williams book Rise? And I said, no, I, I haven't. And I, I, um, I got your book and that was when I was like, I'm going to get Sean on the podcast <laughs> because there was so much of your book that resonated with me. But also, I think, like I said in my introduction, just really interested me about because, um, you know, you're, you're looking at post-traumatic growth, basically, aren't you? And that's mm -hmm. now what you look at as a psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, and I also found it really interesting how you said, and I know you wrote this back in, I think it was 2016. So it was, it was quite a long time ago now. So you probably do feel a little different. But back then you said that all of the other self-help books you read, you were reading them from people that felt healed already. So they yeah. were stronger following their trauma. Yeah. Um, and at the time you said you were still finding your way. What yeah. about now? Have you found your way? I don't think you ever find your way. I don't. I don't think you ever start one place in, and 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 you're, you're not well, and then you get to another place and it's like ta da, and now I'm healed. I think. I think it's a constant back and forth. I think it's a constant back and forth, and I think you know if it's not if it's not cancer, it will be something else. You you mentioned my dad. My dad died at the end of last year. My lovely friend for thirty years, Bill Turnbull, man I worked with for eleven years on that breakfast over he died last year um you know there was a lot there was a lot going on and there's always going to be in life there's always going to be stuff that comes at you unexpectedly and I think um 
and and so that it, it it's hard to think right well now i'm sorted <laughs> and and also you don't know whether how you're going to respond to the next thing that comes up you hope that with with this learning and this understanding that you will respond to it in perhaps a more knowledgeable way maybe but the emotions have a funny way of tripping you up it, you, you can know you can know it all you know, the number of people I sit in front of, the number of patients and clients I sit in front of saying, I know this, but I don't feel it. And and I think, you know, there are some, for example, there are some therapies which are very much about, um, oh, we just need to change the way you think. You know, if you thought more like this and less like this, then then you'll feel a lot better. It's like, yeah, I know that. Rationally, I know that, but I can't feel it. There is the, the mind body connection is not there. It is not the thoughts, the thoughts and how I'm feeling viscerally in my body and not connecting. And that I think is the key. The key is how do we make it connect for people? Um, but I think emotions and feelings are always going to trip you up unexpectedly and events. Yeah. Yeah. But what I find fascinating from starting this podcast and speaking to people who have been through life changing events, which I'm sure you've got the same experience, is how many of them feel that their life is now enriched um, following their adversity. So, so many people have said to me, my life feels enriched. I have more opportunities. I say yes more. And I always say to them, I just don't feel like I'm there yet. And maybe it's because I'm earlier earlier in my journey um, but I don't know how you feel about that do you feel that any part of your cancer journey has enriched your life at all um that is that is also quite a tricky one I think because I think there's telling somebody that they should be stronger because of their because of a, the a trauma that they've experienced um is 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 quite hard, isn't it? I think it's quite I think it's quite hard for somebody to hold that, and and I, and I think especially if you're working with people with trauma, it it's a it's a difficult message to say, yeah, but you're going to be so much stronger because of this. You know, just think of that. So I think it's quite a sort of I think it's quite a delicate and very personal thing. I learnt lots about myself. I think. I learned lots about myself in the early stages of recovery. And then when I think often you have time and, a ref well, eventually, when you have time and uh, to reflect, and then I thought, well, life's going to be completely different for me. You know, I'm going to stop doing this and stop doing that. And I'll, you know, I won't, I won't be so busy and da, 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 da. Um, and actually, my life is pretty much proper. I mean it's it's different I'm doing a different job obviously um yeah but 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 I think who we are is often who we are and we might get more of an understanding of who we are because of the cancer experience because we have we reflect on how we respond to it but it doesn't automatically mean we are stronger um I think we can recognize I think recognizing our own fragility and vulnerability makes us stronger. I think recognizing that actually you can't do everything on your own and that reaching out to people who want to help you is a good thing because it helps them because sometimes people don't the people who love you don't know how to help you, especially if you're like, I know it's all right, I can manage, you don't need to come to my appointments. No, no, you know, I'm fine, I'm fine. Oh, you know, if you're bloody minded, that sense and I'm just picturing you, Emma, thinking, right, well, I'm going to exercise and I'm going to do this and I'm going to get from here to there, yeah. you know, setting yourself, it's setting yourself tasks and things. Um, and, and I don't know your life and your recovery. Um, but, but, but it can be, you know, you can often set yourself up as a kind of, um, be armored, be quite heavily armored. You know, I'm doing it and I'm, and I'm doing it and I'm doing it. Fine. I don't want, I don't want to worry about you. You don't need to help me, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah. So I think, uh, yeah does that feel familiar yeah it's protective isn't it as well yeah of course it's protective exactly so i think um adversity mm -hmm. shakes your belief in yourself yeah that it can do um i think when you can't walk when you used to run marathons when you're when you've got drains around your body and 
you you can you can barely walk to the front door um you know those sorts of things shake your understanding of yourself as a as a healthy human uh and and i think i think that can be that can be hard but you know there's a, there's a philosopher called Ludwig Wittgenstein and he said to his students you've got to go the bloody hard way and thinking about these things is often downright nasty and when it's nasty it's most important uh so i think i think adversity can shake us our understanding of our place in the world our understanding of you know other people i don't know how, whether you found this but sometimes when we go through something difficult the people we imagine will be there for us maybe um and not available and the uh, people who surprise you are you know so i think i think it it the way you relate to people ch- can change um there's this uh, this is brilliant psychologist called george bonono who talks about resilience um and and resilience is 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 really obviously resilience is is a really key thing he calls it though coping ugly coping ugly you know it doesn't look nice coping yeah after difficult it's difficult and bloody and but but you do and perhaps and you do learn something about yourself and other people perhaps along the way yes talk to me about resilience you just mentioned resilience and in your book um you said you believe we are all resilient creatures and we just need to tap into it do you Mm. think you're a resilient person um am i a resilient person I think we are we are all resilient. Humans are resilient. I mean, the rates of PTSD are um, always horrifying, but they're small, um, and you can recover from psychological injury. And I think there's this there's this um, uh, psychologist called Carl Rogers who talks about the ability to the human capacity to grow the human capacity to move towards the light. And he grew up in Chicago, I think. And when he used to go downstairs to the cellar in his house, he noticed some potatoes. Um, and there was it was very dark in the cellar, but there was just a chink of light coming from the ceiling. And the tubers from the potatoes, you know, those spindly things that grow out of potatoes, were always pointing upwards towards the light. And he said, this is, this is like the human spirit. It's, he, he called it the self-actualizing tendency, but the tendency to, not the tendency, the human capacity for growth, the cu- human capacity, to, even if it's bloody and difficult, even if it looks ugly, even if you're struggling, even if there's back and forth, even if you're not who you are at the end of it, you are growing. And you've said we grow, um, growth may emerge from the processing of that trauma. So mm. if we talk about that word processing, because I think that's very yeah. important. How yeah. does one process trauma? Uh, you process trauma in a place that feels safe for you. Uh, ideally, you would process trauma with someone to help you. I think it takes time. I think it can be really difficult. I work with a lot of people who have seen and experienced things that affect them to this day, where the past is something that's happened years and years ago, is still playing into the present. And and when you're caught up in the present in something that feels traumatic, even though you're safe, you know, that's that's really hard. So you've got before you process, you've almost got to you've got to create a climate of safety before you can go there. So so you don't, for example, if you're if you're with somebody and you're dealing and and something really difficult has happened to them and they have experienced trauma or they have PTSD, you don't go there first. You don't get you don't open that box. You start somewhere else. You start creating the relationship. You start creating an atmosphere of safety um, and trust, really important. Um, and and you start understanding how PTSD or trauma or stress or anxiety is affecting their day-to-day life. And then you really move incredibly slowly through it. And 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 sometimes it's too 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 hot to touch. 
So if it's too too hot to touch, then we might not go there then. Um, I think it's sort of understanding, am I in a safe place to pause and reflect? Do I have support if it gets too much? Who can I do this with that I trust? I think that is how you process. And and also I'm I'm trained in EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing, um, which works which works quite quickly, uh, can work quite quickly on trauma. Um, and that's a different way of that's that's more like um, imaginal exposure. So you are you are with somebody and you 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 join them as they as they're sort of navigating. Uh, what happened to them and the effect it had on them, but they are the driver and you're ju- you're just the navigator. So they and and it's amazing, you know what the what what the brain does, how it how it starts to make connections. If we've experienced yeah. something highly traumatic, sometimes the brain doesn't encode memories in the right place because it's we're just surviving. So we're not there to think straight. We're just there to survive. And and, and it's I like think a it's, jumble, isn't it? It's like a jumble. So it's how do we encode the memories uh, so that it, it makes sense and so that we can put that in the past so that you know that you've had a cancer experience. I know that I've had a cancer experience, but we're not in the same heightened emotional place as we may have been while we were living through it. Mm. So what have you done to process your trauma specifically? I found journaling incredibly useful while I was going through um, the cancer experience because I couldn't make sense of it. So I thought, at least I can shout onto a page. I don't know what to do with all this stuff. I don't know what to do with all the thoughts and feelings and emotion and um, and I don't I don't want to share it with anyone currently. Um, so I'm just going to shout it onto a page. And actually, I could close the book. So you write, you close the book, you put it away. I found that very, very helpful. And actually, with with one of my um, with one of my clients, we did a lot of journaling together, but we also did artwork together. So <clears throat> when when she couldn't vocalize the trauma that had happened to her, she's okay with me speaking about it because um, because I used her as part of a research project. We used her experience as part of a research project. Um, she couldn't, it was, it was like speaking the unspeakable. And sometimes in therapy, it, people can't say the words because it's just too difficult to say. So you have to find other ways of doing it. Now, writing can work for a lot of people, which is why, you know, things like journaling, but also gratitude diaries. And I know there's a lot of poo-pooing about that, that kind of thing. But it works. And the research, I'm all about the re- empirical evidence. The research suggests it yeah. works. There's something about seeing your words on a page and being able to close the book, that works. And you're nodding. So no, I just you... find it, it's facing it, isn't it? So I, yeah. I was never a writer. I'd never written a journal. And then it was my psychologist that I was seeing whilst I was going through treatment that said, try mm-hmm. writing it down. Because okay. um, like I said, my thoughts were in a massive jumble, yeah. huge jumble. The yeah. timelines were all off. So just mm. by writing it down and it makes so much, it just makes so much sense to me write it down you know it becomes logical you make sense of your thoughts and I think that's where I got a lot of my processing from and now with these chats as well actually is Mm. talking about it Mm. Um, and you know you mentioned vulnerability finding strength in that vulnerability Mm. as well has been very helpful for me yeah to to process what about mindfulness you mentioned that at the beginning and I wanted to come back to that you said you've done some research on mindfulness Mm-hmm. Um, have you used it? Has it been helpful? Mindfulness has been very helpful. I think it's more about a mindful way of being rather than mindfulness and meditation per se. So for me, and it's a very, it is a very individual thing, but I, I remember speaking to Andy Puddicombe, who created Headspace, the ex-Buddhist monk. And I said, I find it so difficult. And I still find mindfulness, meditation, the practice of meditation, I find difficult. And, you know, I've been doing it for a while. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it will ever be something where I'm, you know, and he said that you, there's, there's no necessary, there's no goal. 
necessarily. You know, don't don't beat yourself up about it. And I said, well, I should be doing it every day. And he said, no, it's the shoulds that are the problem here. Um, there's no should about it. You know, if it's helpful, use it. If it's helpful, use it. I do find a more and and having been been trained in it was really useful because that made me think about a more mindful way of being. So just being a curious observer of what is going on for you and just creating a space where you can sit outside it and go, oh, that's interesting. Where did that come from? I wonder if. And being more wondering and being more curious. So rather than being enmeshed and really stuck in the thing, which we all can be, it's like going, oh, okay, that's me experiencing that thing. I wonder why I'm feeling like that. And so it's just that that is a more mindful way of being. So I think that is what it's that is what it's taught me. And also it introduced me to some amazing poetry by Mary Oliver, who you I'm sure you've heard of. There's this great phrase. And while I was doing my research into mindfulness with people with cancer, um, a lovely man who was experiencing um, prostate cancer said to me that the way he summed it up about being present, being there in the moment, what am I experiencing now? How am I experiencing it? How am I reacting to it? Um, is, is a line from the Mary Oliver poem. I can't remember the title of the poem, but the line is, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And he said when he was in one of those moments, he would ask himself, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And just the preciousness of it struck him. You know, bring yourself back from whatever you're caught up in. Bring yourself back from the rumination and the catastrophization and, the, and just breathe and be a bit more mindful yeah. about how you yeah. deal with it. Yeah, I'm very interested in the interrelationship between the mind and the body. So that for me is where mindfulness mm. fits in quite nicely. Because yeah. I feel when one partakes in mindfulness, they're really able to kind of bring it to the physical. Um, and yes. sometimes when people are struggling, struggling physically, I find that that mindfulness and can really help. It's sometimes what people are missing, I think. Yeah. So that's yeah, really good I'd point. be really interested to read your research. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think just, you know, you you being a physiotherapist in your work, I'm sure you come across lots of people who are stuck in their bodies and 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 stuff isn't moving. And and I think just an understanding of that kind of mind body connection and how to at first see the stuckness. And I don't want to be too psychological about it, but be kind about the stuckness. Um, and and bring that that more mindful way of oh it makes sense that my your stomach is really tight at this moment or it makes sense that and and just that bring a bit of compassion to it I think I think yeah just concentrating on the breath and bringing a sense of the here and now back in really helps and it helps with people who are in pain so that self-compassion bringing that self-compassion into somebody who's experiencing pain and that and that can help with feelings of self-blame and high anxiety and catastrophization just softening we do, I do this um exercise with some of my clients a mindfulness exercise which is called soften soothe allow and it's all about breathing into the space that feels tight and hard and stuck and just softening the edges and soothing it and bringing kindness mm. to it and sort of allowing it to to be there if that's where it is you know so non-judgmental yeah. and that can really help yeah I think that's a great place to finish so I, I like to um, end with a final question Sean mm. if you could go back in time to when things were at their toughest whenever that might be what do you wish you could have told yourself? It'll be okay. Remember to reach for the outstretched hands. Yeah. And a dog can help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, healing dog. Um, 
<laughs> Where can people find you, Sean, if they want to know more? Um, so um, I'm on Radio 4 and BBC Sound, so life-changing, and that hears from loads of people who've experienced some really interesting huge moments in their life that have turned things on a sixpence and made made them reconfigure things differently. So there, um, Rise, which you know about um, surviving and thriving after trauma is a book I'm meant to be writing another one. I'm, that is what I'm going to get mm. onto. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's like, it. and I'm on Twitter. So you can find, I'm not very good on it, but that's where I, <laughs> Twitter and Instagram, I need to learn. Yeah, as do I. <laughs> um, thank you, Sean. I honestly feel really honoured that you gave up some time to talk to me today. I hugely admire you as a broadcaster. Um, I love your podcast um, and I aspire for this to one day be as successful as, as your podcast. Thank you for your bravery and sharing your story in your book, Rise, which I have right next to me. It, it really helped me and I'm sure it helped countless other individuals who are dealing with their own trauma. So really, thank you. Oh, gosh. That has really brought tears to my eyes, actually. Thank you so oh, much. That is so lovely. What a lovely thing to say. Thank you for doing what you do. You see? See what you've done here? I've got the rest yeah. of the there. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, thank you. Thanks for thanks for the chat. Thanks for the chat. It's been it's been really lovely talking to you. Thank you, Sean. I really enjoyed that chat with Sean, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Sean is truly inspirational, and I think hearing her discussing trauma from her unique perspective is a fabulous way to kickstart season three of the podcast. If you did enjoy listening, please do tick the subscribe button. Rate us, review us. It doesn't take long, but it really does make a difference. Thank you.